Chapter 20 of Danger in Deep Space. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Danger in Deep Space by Carey Rockwell. Narrated by Sam Holloway. Chapter 20 There's only one answer, boys, said Connell. Loring and Mason have escaped and taken over the ship. I can't think of any other reason Tom would abandon us like this. The jet boat was crowded. Alfie, the smallest, was sitting on Astro's lap. For more than an hour they had circled above the copper satellite, searching the surrounding skies in vain for some sign of the Polaris. Major, said Roger, who was hunched over the steering wheel of the small spacecraft. We're almost out of fuel. We'd better drop down on the night side of Junior, the side away from the sun. At least there we'd be out of the direct heat. Very well, Roger, said Connell. In fact, we could keep shifting into the night side every hour. Then he added quietly, thoughtfully. But we're out of fuel, you said? Yes, sir, said Roger. There's just enough to get down. Roger sent the craft in a shallow dive. Suddenly the rockets cut out. The last of the fuel was gone. Roger glided the jet boat to a smooth stop on the night side of the planetoid. How much longer before the reactor units go up? asked Shinny. Connell turned, thinking he had heard something on the communicators, then answered Shinny's question. Only four hours, he said. The crew of spacemen climbed out of the jet boat into the still blackness of the night side of the planet. There wasn't anything left to do. They sat around on the hard surface of the planet, staring at the strange stars overhead. You know, said Astro, I might be able to set up something to convert some of the U-235 in the reactors to fuel the jet boat. Impossible, Astro, said Alfie. You'd need a reduction gear, and not only that, but you haven't any tools to handle the mass. If you opened one of those boxes, you'd be fried immediately by the radiation. Half is right, said Connell. There's nothing to do but wait. Major Connell turned his face up as far as he could in the huge fishbowl helmet to stare at the sky. His eyes wandered from star cluster to star cluster, from glowing Regulus to bright and powerful Sirius. He stifled a sigh. How much he had wanted to see more and more and more of the great wide high and deep. He remembered his early days as a youth on his first trip to Lunar City, his first sensation at touching an alien world, his skipper, old, wise and patient, who had given him his creed as a spaceman. Travel wide, deep and high, the skipper had said to the young Connell, but never so far, so wide or so deep as to forget that you're an Earthman, or how to act like an Earthman. Even now, years later, the gruff voice rang in his ears. It wasn't long after that that he had met Shinny. Connell smiled behind the protection of his helmet as he looked at the wizened spaceman, who was now old and toothless, but who still had the same merry twinkle in his eyes that Connell had noticed the first time he saw him. Connell had signed on as first officer on a deep space abound for Titan. Shinny had come aboard and reported to Connell as rocketman. Shinny had promptly started roaring through the passageways of the huge freighter in his nightshirt, singing snatches of old songs at the top of his voice. It had taken Connell four hours to find where Shinny had hidden the bottle of rocket juice. Connell laughed. He looked over at the old man fondly. Say, Nick, said Connell, addressing the man by his given name for the first time. You remember the time it took me four hours to find that bottle of rocket juice you hid on the old Titan freighter? Shinny cackled, his thin voice coming over the headphones of the others as well as Connell's. I sure do, Lou, replied Shinny, using Connell's first name. They were just old spacemen now, reliving old times together. Funny thing, though, you never knew I had two more bottles hidden in the tube chamber. Why, you old space crawler! roared Connell. You put one over on me! Roger and Astro and Alfie had never known Connell's first name. They rolled the name over in their minds, fitting the name to the man. Unknown to each other, they decided that the name fitted the man, Lou Connell. Say, Lou, asked Shinny, where in the blessed universe did you come from? You never told me. 
there was a long pause. A place called Telfer Estates. In the deep south, on the North American continent, I was raised on a farm close by. I used to go fishing late at night and stare up at the stars. He paused again. I ran away from home. I don't know if... if... anyone's still there or not. I never went back. There was a long silence as each man saw a small boy fishing late at night, barefoot, his toes dangling in the water, a worm wiggling on the end of a string, more interested in the stars that twinkled overhead than in any fish that might swim past and seize the hook. Where are you from, Nick? asked Connell. Born in space, cackled Chinny, on a passenger freighter carrying colonists out to Titan. Never had a breath of natural fresh air till I was almost a grown man. Nothing but synthetic stuff under the atmosphere screens. My father was a mining engineer. I was the only kid. One night a screen busted, and nearly everybody suffocated or froze to death. My pa and ma was among them. I blasted off after that. Been in the deep ever since. And you know, by the blessed rings of Saturn, I'd be on a nice farm near Venusport living on a pension, if you hadn't kicked me out of the solar guard. "'Why, you've broken that old piece of space junk!' roared Connell. "'Ah, Yoda!' Connell never finished what he was going to say. "'Attention! Attention! Roger! Astro! Major Connell, come in, please! This is Tom on the Polaris!' As if they'd been struck by a bolt of lightning, the five spacemen sat up and then raced to the jet boat. "'Connell to Corbett!' roared the Major. "'Where are you? What happened?' I haven't got time to explain now, sir, said Tom. Loring and Mason escaped and forced me to take them to Tara. I managed to overcome them and blast back here. Meet me up about fifty miles above Junior, sir. I'm bringing the Polaris in. No, yelled Connell. It's no use, Tom. We're out of fuel. We've used up all our power. Then stand by, said Tom grimly. I'm coming in for a landing. No, Tom, roared Connell. There's nothing you can do. We're too far into the sun's pull. You'll never blast off again. I don't care if we all wind up as cinders, said Tom. I'm coming in. The communicator went dead, and from the left, over the close horizon of the small satellite, the Polaris swept into view like a red-tailed fire dragon. It shot up in a pre-touchdown manoeuvre, and then began to drop slowly to the surface of the planetoid. No sooner had the Polaris touched the dry airless ground than the airlock hatch was opened. From the crystal port on the control deck, Tom waved to the men below him. Shinny climbed into the lock first, followed by Astro, Alfie, Roger and Connell. While Roger and Alfie closed the hatch, Astro and Connell adjusted the oxygen pressure and waited for the supply to build to normal. At last the hissing stopped and the hatch to the inner part of the ship opened. Tom greeted them with a smile and an outstretched hand. Glad to have you aboard, he joked. After the backslapping between Roger, Astro and Tom was over, Connell questioned Tom on his strange departure from the satellite. It was just like I told you, sir, explained Tom. They got out of the brig, he paused, not mentioning the spoon that Loring had used or how he'd gotten it. They forced me to take them to Tara. I managed to get the gravity turned off and gave them a lesson in free-fall fighting. They're still frozen stiff up on the control deck. Good boy, said Connell. I'll go and have a talk with them. Meantime, Astro, you and Shinny and Alfie get below and see how much fuel we have in emergency supply. We're going to need every ounce we have. Aye, aye, sir, said Astro. The three hurried to the power deck. Connell followed Roger and Tom to the control deck. Loring and Mason were still in the positions they were in when Tom had fired his paralo ray. Connell took Tom's gun and switched to the neutralizer. He fired twice and the two men rose shakily to their feet. Connell faced them, his eyes burning. I'm going to say very little to you two space-crawling rats, snapped Connell. I'm not going to lock you in the brig. I'm not going to confine you in any manner. But if you make one false move, I'll court-martial you right here and now! You've caused enough trouble with your selfishness, jeopardizing the lives of six men. If we fail to get off this satellite, it'll be because you put us in this position. Now get below and see what aid you can give Astro. 
And if either of you so much as raises your voice, I'm gonna let him take care of you. Is that clear? Yes, sir, mumbled Loring. We understand, sir. And we'll do everything we can to... to make up for what we've done. The only thing you can do is to stay out of my sight, said Connell coldly. Loring and Mason scuttled past Connell and climbed down to the power deck. Attention, attention, control deck, Major Connell. Sir, this is Roger on the radar bridge. I've just checked over Tom's figures on thrust, sir, and I'm not sure, but I think we've passed the point of safety. Thanks, Roger, said Connell. He turned to the intercom. Power deck, check in. Power deck, aye, said Astro. Lowering in Mason there, asked Connell. Yes, sir. I'm putting them right to work in the radiation chamber, sir. I'm piling all emergency fuel into the reaction chambers to try for one big push. Why? asked Connell. I heard what Roger said, sir, replied Astro. This'll give us enough thrust to clear the sun's gravity, but there's something else that might not take it. What? asked Connell. The cooling pumps, sir, said Astro. They may not be able to handle a load as hot as this. We might blow up. Connell considered this for a moment. Do what you can, Astro. I have absolute faith in you. Aye, aye, sir, said Astro. And thank you. If this wagon holds together, I'll get her off. Connell turned to Tom, who stood ready at the control panel. All set, sir, said Tom. Roger's given me a clear trajectory forward and up. All we need is Astro's push. Unless Astro can build enough pressure in those coolant pumps to handle the overload of reactant fuel, we're done for. We'll get off this moon in pieces. Power deck to control deck. Come in, Astro, said Tom. Almost ready, Tom, said Astro. Maximum pressure is 800, and we're up to 770 now. Very well, Astro, replied Connell. Let her build all the way to an even 800 and blast at my command. Aye, aye, sir, said Astro. The mighty pumps on the power deck began their piercing shriek. Higher and higher they built up the pressure, until the ship began to rock under the strain. Stand by, Tom, ordered Connell. And if you've ever twisted those dials, twist them now! Yes, sir, replied Tom. Pressure up to 791, sir, reported Astro. Attention! All members strap into acceleration cushions! One by one, Shinny and Alfie, Loring and Mason, Astro and Roger, strapped themselves into the acceleration cushions. Roger set the radar scanner and strapped himself in on the radar bridge. Connell slumped into the second pilot's chair and took over the controls of the ship, strapping himself in, while Tom beside him did the same. The whine of the pumps was now a shrill whistle that drowned out all other sounds, and the great ship bucked under the force of the thrust building in her heart. In front of the power deck control panel, Astro watched the pressure gauge mount steadily. Pressure up to 796, sir, he called. Stand by to fire all rockets, roared Connell. Make it good, you Venusian clunk, yelled Roger. 799, sir, bellowed Astro. Astro watched the gauge of the pressure creep slowly toward the 800 mark. In all his experience, he had never seen it above 700. Shinny too, his merry eyes shining bright, watched the needle jerk back and forth and finally reach the 800 mark. 800, sir, bellowed Astro. Fire all stern rockets, roared Connell. Astro threw the switch. On the control board, Connell saw a red light flash on. He jammed the master switch down hard. It was the last thing he remembered. End of chapter 20